Welcome once again to the virtual class. In this class, we are going to continue with our basic embryology lecture series. And uh, in this particular class, we'll talk about the events of the second week of human embryonic development. Maybe before we start, just to remind you that the prenatal developmental periods, we divided them into these two. I, by now, I think this has become a bit redundant for you, but I like reminding you about it. And the events that take place after conception, we divide that period into three. The pre-embryonic period has the first and the second week of development. We have already talked about the first week of development in our previous lecture. So today we are focusing on the second week of development. Of course, we also have the embryonic period, which spans from week three until week eight, and the fetal period, which spans from week nine until birth. For you to understand the events of the second week, it is important that you remind yourself about the events of the first week. So just in summary, remember during the first week of development, the conceptus was propelled along the fallopian tube from the site of fertilization to the site of implantation. During that time, the conceptus underwent cleavage and that led to morphological changes in the conceptors. So that we had what we call the zygote, which went to two cell stage, four cell stage, then modular and blastocyst. At the end of the first week, we had a structure which we call the blastocyst that had two cellular populations the population designated to become the baby and the population designated to become the placenta. We talked about parts of the blastocyst. The individual cells of the blastocyst are called blastomeres. The blastocyst has an inner cell mass, which we call the embryoblast, and an outer cell mass that we call the trophoblast. We have the blastocyst cavity, that space. The blastocyst has two poles, abembryonic and the embryonic pole. So that is basically what we saw in the first week. What are we going to see in the second week of development? In the second week of development, the blastocyst will implant itself. And so we are going to establish the pregnancy. And we've already talked about implantation again in our previous lecture. In the second week, again, we have morphological changes that take place involving both cellular populations, the inner cell population and the outer cell population, there's some morphological changes that occur around them and we'll be seeing those changes. During the second week of development, there is also formation of the fetal membranes. These are tissue layers that cover the baby, separating the baby from the mother. Generally, the events of the second week of development, from academic point of view, they tend to occur in twos. And so we call the second week of development the week of twos, because things tend to occur in twos. So in terms of our learning outcome for this lecture, perhaps we just review briefly the process of implantation then now go to the specific agenda of today's class. We'll describe the morphological changes that occur in the embryoblast during the second week of development. We'll also describe the morphological changes which occur in the trophoblast during the second week of development. And while we do that, we'll explain why the second week is called the week of truth. Then we will talk about why it is possible to make a diagnosis of pregnancy very early, and we look at the basis of that. 
Lastly, we'll talk about some of the abnormalities that can be noted during the second week of development. So the abnormality they can develop during the second week of development. So let's start with just briefly reviewing the process of implantation. But remember, we've already done implantation extensively in the previous lecture. So in this one, we're just going to review briefly on what it's all about. Implantation is a process of invading of the endometrium. <clears throat> and this invasion is done by the blastocyst. The trophoblast layer of the blastocyst is the one that invades the endometrium. It is the process of attachment and embedding of the blastocyst into the endometrium. It begins around the sixth day and is completed at towards the end of the second week, which means that most of the events of implantation take place during the second week of development. Importantly, where the conceptus implants, that is where the placenta will form. And at around the time of implantation, a woman may bleed slightly. That spotting is called implantation bleeding. Remember, it may be confused with a menstrual flow because they occur around the same time or around the time that they're both expected. So in terms of the key events, the blastocyst must first undergo hatching, which is the extrusion of the blastocyst from the shell of the zona pellucida. After that, what you have is late blastocyst. During hatching, the part that leads the way is the abembryonic pole of the blastocyst. After the blastocyst has hatched, it is the embryonic pole of the blastocyst that will now attach onto the endometrial lining. So that is attachment. After attachment, the trophoblast develops two cellular layers, an outer cellular layer, which we call the syncytial trophoblast, which is useful in invading the endometrium, but that layer also secretes human chorionic gonadotropin. After syncytial trophoblast has formed, of course, it will then burrow into the endometrium. And so the conceptors will enter the endometrium. As that is happening, some cavities that are filled with blood will appear within the syncytial trophoblast. We call these cavities trophoblastic lacuna, enabling exchange of substances between the conceptors and the mother. We call that the primitive uteroplacental unit. So the primitive uteroplacental unit is established at this time. As you can see, the concept as it's going in, and once it is fully in, the part that it used, the defect it created, must first form through forming a fibrin clot that will then repair itself. The epithelium will have to repair itself eventually. By this time, we are now around day 13. And so the second week is almost over. So that is happening. And that is what we discussed uh, last time when we discussed implantation. So now let's go to the specific agenda of today's class. I want us to summarize these three concepts together. And I'll approach it from academic point of view where we are going to look at why we call it the second, the week of twos. But as we underscore why we call the second week the week of twos, we will be talking about the morphological changes that occur in the inner cell mass, as well as those that occur in the outer cell mass. So why do we call the second week the week of twos? Some of this you already know. During the second week of development, development begins with the blastocyst. We've already mentioned that the blastocyst has two cell masses. We have the inner cell mass, 
and the outer cell mass. So that is one of the reasons why we call the second week the week of twos. We have two cell masses forming during the second week. The inner cell mass represents the population of cells that will become the baby, so we call it the embryoblast. The outer cell mass represents the population of cells designated to become the placenta, we call the trophoblast. The second reason why we call the second week the week of twos is because during this time, and especially when you're beginning the second week, the concept has us two poles. This pole away from the inner cell mass is what we call the abembryonic pole. It is a pole the concept has used already during hatching. It's the one that leads the way during hatching. This other pole is called the embryonic pole. This is the pole the concept has uses during the implantation process. And that happens during the second week. The third reason why we call the second week, the week of twos is this. Again, this one we already mentioned. That during the second week of development, the outer cell mass, the trophoblast, differentiate into two layers. There's an outer layer of cells where the cells don't seem to have definite cell boundary. Look at this. You see a nucleus there, you see another nucleus there, you see another nucleus there, but we don't see the boundaries between the nucleus. It appears like the nuclei are fused together. And that is why we call this layer the trophoblast, syncytio trophoblast. Syncytio means fused or uniform together, kind of. And it was believed that, or assumed that these cells were actually fused together, therefore termed syncytio trophoblast. The syncytio trophoblast is the one that invades the endometrium during implantation process. It is also the one that secretes the human chorionic gonadotropin, the one, the hormone that supports the corpus luteum so that corpus luteum can continue producing progesterone. It is the one that will develop cavities inside it, which we call trophoblastic lacuna, enabling primitive exchange between the conceptors and the mother. The inner layer of the trophoblast is this one, where the cells have definite cell boundaries. So we call it cytotrophoblast, cyto for cells. We can be able to see cells definitely. So those are the two layers of the trophoblast. Part of the reason why we call the second week of development the week of twos. Those three that I've mentioned, we already knew them. We've just brought them into perspective. Let me add to that list then, why we call the second week of development, the week of tools. Now I'll be mentioning newer things that we've not mentioned before. This shows you the shell of the conceptors, primarily focusing on the trophoblast with its two layers cytotrophoblast and syncytiotrophoblast. During the second week of development, we agreed that there are morphological changes that will take place in the trophoblast. And I've mentioned one already, that we have two layers of the trophoblast. There are also morphological changes which take place in the inner cell mass. And one of the striking morphological changes is this, that the cells of the inner cell mass rearrange into two layers. The cells of the embryoblast rearrange into two layers. We call those layers the epiblast and the hypoblast. Let's say something about them. So the epiblast refer to the layer 
that contain columnar cells. So there's a layer of columnar epithelium, simple columnar epithelium for that matter. That layer of columnar epithelium is known as the epiblast layer. Then there's a layer that is made up of cuboidal cells. We call that the hypoblast. Remember the cells of the inner cell mass are the ones which are rearranging or reorganizing into those two layers. That time of development when the inner cell mass has those two layers begin from around the ninth day after conception. So from day nine onwards, we have this structure here. Remember the blastocyst was present from day five up to day eight there. So from day nine, we have this structure here. The time of development when we have this structure is basically known as the bilamina disc stage. Why do we call it so? Because this is the time that the embryo has two layered. We have the two layered embryo. The two layered embryo is called the bilamina embryonic disc or the bilamina jam disc. And so the bilamina jam disc has the epiblast layer and the hypoblast layer. Another thing why we call the second week of development, the week of twos, is because during the second week of development, there are two cavities that form, which are these two cavities. We have what we call the amniotic cavity and the yolk sac cavity. I want to start the yolk sac cavity. This is how the yolk sac cavity forms. Some cells of the hypoblast migrate away from the hypoblast. Even though they migrate, they maintain their intercellular contacts. These cells change their morphology from being cuboidal to maybe relatively flattened out, they form a membrane, which we call the yolk sac. This yolk sac is one of the fetal membranes to be established. Remember I told you during the second week of development, we have establishment of fetal membranes. The yolk sac is one of the fetal membranes to be established. The other name given to the yolk sac is umbilical vesicle. So we have formation of the umbilical vesicle. This region here is called the yolk sac cavity. It may contain nutrients which help to nourish the conceptors. The yolk sac is important for providing nutrition to the conceptors. There are other functions of the yolk sac that we will talk about when we study the fetal membranes as a topic of their own. Now we can talk about the amniotic cavity. How does amniotic cavity form? Almost similar concept, but now in this case, the cells of the epiblast are the ones which migrate away from it. Now this is how they migrate. So the cells of the epiblast migrate away from it. Those cells maintain their intercellular contact they flatten out to form one membrane. That membrane that they form is known as the amniotic membrane. The individual cells that constitute or form the amniotic membrane are called the amnioblast cells. So these individual cells are known as the amnioblast cells. That membrane that the amnioblast cells form is the amniotic membrane. You can also call it the amnion. The amnioblast cells produce some water into the amniotic cavity. That water secreted by the amnioblast cells 
is what you're calling the amniotic fluid. And this whole complex of the amniotic cavity, amniotic fluid, and amniotic membrane is what we're referring to as the amniotic sac. So the amniotic sac is the fluid and the membranes that enclose it. Right. So we've talked about many things so far. In this slide, we've talked about two layers of the embryo, two cavities. The other reason why we call the second week the week of twos is going to come soon. But before I tell you that, maybe something you need to know about the second week, this is not happening in twos, but you need to mention it. This gap, the gap between the, the gap between the inner cell mass and the outer cell mass, this gap here become filled with some cells. The cells that fill that gap are known as the extra embryonic mesoderm. Need to understand why it's called so. Extra embryonic here would mean that it's outside the embryo, so that is okay because this is the embryo. So these are tissues outside the embryo. So we call it extra embryonic because this is the embryo, the bilamina embryo, the bilamina disc represents the embryo, the baby. These ones form outside the baby, they're extra embryonic. So this green part, refer to the extembryonic mesoderm, the tissues that form outside the baby, separating the baby and the trophoblast. Now that happens during the second week of development. Based on that, now I can introduce something that occurs in twos again. A cavity appears within the extembryonic mesoderm there are usually multiple cavities that coalesce to form one large cavity in that manner. So this space here is a cavity that has formed. I'll give you the name of that cavity shortly. But what I want to pick is that with the formation of that cavity, we see that the extra embryonic mesoderm is split into two. There's an inner layer of the extembryonic mesoderm, which we call the splanchnic layer, or the visceral layer of the extembryonic mesoderm. And we have the outer layer of the extembryonic mesoderm, which we call the somatic layer, or the parietal layer of the extembryonic mesoderm. So in terms of the concept of the week of tools, we have two layers of the extembryonic mesoderm, the splanchnic layer and the somatic layer, or the visceral layer and the parietal layer. Although the two layers are split, there's a region where they are still interconnected. That point where the two are still connected is known as the connecting stock. This connecting stock represents the future umbilical cord. If this is going to be the baby, that baby will receive nutrition from the placental structure through that umbilical cord. So this is the future umbilical cord. The baby will be here the placenta will be the blue part, and this will be the umbilical cord. Now, look at this. The somatic layer of extembryonic mesoderm is very intimate with the cytotrophoblast, 
which is also very intimate with the syncytial trophoblast. Those three tissues constitute the chorionic plate. The chorionic plate is a third fetal membrane that I'm mentioning in this lecture. Remember the first one was the yolk sac. The second one I mentioned was the amniotic membrane. So that is also a fetal membrane. The chorionic plate is the third fetal membrane that I'm mentioning. Remember I told you that during the second week we have establishment of fetal membrane. There are a total of four, I'm going to mention one shortly. So the chronic plate is made up of the somatic layer of exembranic mesoderm, cytotrophoblast, and syncytotrophoblast. The whole of this is the chronic plate. It surrounds the developing conceptors. The space between the splanchnic and the somatic layer of the exembranic mesoderm is therefore termed the chorionic cavity. This chorionic cavity is also known as the gestational sac. So we call it chorionic cavity. Some people may call it extra embryonic silom or the gestational sac. From clinical point of view, from ultrasound point of view, we prefer calling it the gestational sac. So three fetal membranes so far I've mentioned, yolk sac, amniotic membrane, and the chorionic plate. There is something that happens to the chorion during the second week, not captured in these images, but it also happened in tools, and I want to mention it. The chorion near where the umbilical cord there is, the chorion that will correspond to the site of implantation, that chorion will have its cytotrophoblast growing some extensions, not shown here, which we call villi. And so the part of the chorion with the villi is known as the villus chorion. And the part of the chorion without villi is called the non villus chorion. They have some other interesting names. The villus chorion is known as chorion frondosum. Frondosum refers to being bushy or the villi. Then the part of the chorion without the villi, the smooth chorion, the non villus chorion, is known as chorion live, written live, chorion live. So that's another reason why we call the second week the week of twos. We have two parts of the chorion, chorion from dosum and chorion live. The fourth fetal membrane that is established is usually an extension of the yolk sac into the connecting stock. Again, I don't have that captured in this image because I didn't want it to be busy, but imagine this cavity extending now inside here. That extension of the yolk sac into the connecting stock is what we call the allantois. And so we have formation of the allantois again during the second week of development. Allantois is A double L T, sorry, A double L A N T O I S, allantois. Right. Those are the reasons why we call the second week the week of twos. I want you to take maybe a minute and name the parts of the embryo shown in this particular image. And you're going to name the parts labeled A all the way to I, based on what we described in this particular lecture. So take time, I'm giving you one minute to 
orient yourself and name them before I show you what the parts are so that you evaluate yourself. These are the different parts of the conceptus at the end of implantation towards the end of the second week of development. The conceptus will have those different parts. So compare this list with what you had in your mind and see how many you could have gotten correctly. The others we haven't labeled like that one. This is basically maternal sinusoids. Remember that the ones that communicate with the trophoblastic lacunae. Remember that thin layer there is the amniotic membrane. And that thin layer there is the yolk sac. And uh, the one outside the amniotic membrane is the splanchnic layer of extembranic mesoderm. This is the bilamina embryo with epiblast and hypoblast. The, the allantois will be an extension of this space into there. It's not shown in this particular image properly. Good, let's make a summary on why we call the second week of development the week of tools. One is that there are two cell masses, the inner cell mass and the outer cell mass. There are two poles, embryonic pole and the abembryonic pole. There are two embryonic layers, epiblast and hypoblast. There are two trophoblastic layers, cytotrophoblast and syncytiotrophoblast. This image shows you the two embryonic layers, epiblast and hypoblast. It also shows you the two trophoblastic layers, cytotrophoblast and syncytiotrophoblast. The previous image showed you the two cell masses, inner cell mass, the embryoblast, outer cell mass, the trophoblast. And this other one showed you, okay, this one still shows you the two poles, embryonic pole used for attachment, abembryonic pole already been used for hatching. Again, during the second week of development, there are two cavities the amniotic cavity that form on the, uh, the side of the epiblast and the yolk sac cavity that forms on the side of the hypoblast. This shows you still the two cavities. Now remember we mentioned that uh, there's some tissue that form between the derivatives of the inner cell mass and the derivatives of the outer cell mass and that tissue is what we call the extembranic mesoderm. It forms during the second week of development. Now, as a concept of tools, there are some cavities that appear within the extembranic mesoderm. I told you that there are multiple cavities that coalesce to form one large one. As they form, we'll have two layers of the extembranic mesoderm. The somatic layer of the extembranic mesoderm being external and the splanchnic layer of the extembrinic mesoderm being internal. So as a concept of tools, there are two layers of the extembrinic mesoderm, somatic layer and the splanchnic layer. Perhaps this other image is better. We've already shown you this one. That is the somatic layer and that is the splanchnic layer of the extembrinic mesoderm. The cavity inside is called the extembrinic cavity or silom or the coronic cavity or gestational sac. One last thing is that during the second week of development, we have establishment of the, of the coronic plate, yes, and this is the coronic plate. Those three layers constitute the coronic plate. Now follow the cytotrophoblast. And you see that this side, the cytotrophoblast has some spikes. The spikes in the cytotrophoblast are known as the villi. So this side of the 
cytotrophoblast, sorry, this side of the chorion has villi, those ones. And this other side of the chorion does not have villi. Therefore, this side of the chorion that does not have villi is called the smooth chorion, the non-villous chorion, the chorion leaf. And this other side that has the villi is known as the chorion frondosum, the bushy chorion or the villous chorion. There are two parts of the chorion during the second week of development. We've seen why we call the second week of development the week of tools. And in the process, we've seen the morphological changes that take place during the second week. Let's make a summary of the morphological changes that take place during the second week of development. One of the things that we mentioned last week, we want to see what happened during the first two weeks, first two weeks. We mentioned that at the beginning, we have a single cell that we call the zygote. That is what we saw on the first day. Then maybe the same day or the following day, the zygote divided into two and we call that the two cell stage. Taking an assumption that both cells divide, on the second day after conception, we had a structure that looks like that, having four cells, and we call it the four cell stage. As development continues and cell division, cleavage continues, by the third to the fourth day, we have a structure that looks like this, and we gave it a name, the morula. So we are on the fourth day, and we are at the morula stage of development. Let's bring this to the next slide. From there, what do we have? We have a structure that looks like this, having separated two cell populations, the inner cell population and the outer cell population. We call this the trophoblast. And so we call that stage the trophoblast stage. Remember, we have the early, sorry, not trophoblast, but blastocyst. We call the structure the blastocyst stage of development. Remember, we have an early blastocyst and a late blastocyst. The early blastocyst is the blastocyst that has not undergone hatching. The late blastocyst has undergone hatching. And so the early blastocyst cannot implant, but the late blastocyst is the one that implants. If you will look at the whole spectrum of the blastocyst stage of development, we'll start from day five, perhaps until the eighth day of development. From the ninth day of development, all the way to the 14th day of development, we have a structure that looks like this. We've just seen it. It has two embryonic layers, the epiblast and the hypoblast. And that is what we call the bilamina embryo. Based on that, we call this the bilamina disc stage of development. So we have the bilamina disc stage of development from day nine, extending to the 14th day of development. That's the bilamina disc stage. The bilamina disc stage has two embryonic layers, epiblast and hypoblast. It has two cavities, amniotic cavity and the yolk sac cavity. The trophoblast has two layers, the syncytial trophoblast and the cytotrophoblast. Something we've not mentioned, which I want you to capture because it's going to be critical in our next class. From day 14 to day 15, something forms within the epiblast layer. And this image shows us that something. The cells of the middle of the epiblast undergo proliferation. And that thickened 
epiblast is known as the primitive streak. That primitive streak is a structure that forms in the middle of the epiblast. When that primitive streak forms, we want to call this stage the primitive streak stage. The primitive streak stage marks the end of the second week of development and the beginning of the third week of development. Now, fundamentally, it marks the end of the early embryonic period, basically, and the beginning of the actual uh, organogenetic period, the period when body organs of the baby start to form. Remember the organogenetic period is the period from the third week all the way to the eighth week after conception. The primitive streak is the forerunner for the organogenetic period of development. So when we see that, we know that now we are changing gear. We are now starting to form body organs of the baby. From the third week of development, body organs form. And the earliest evidence for formation of the body organs is the formation of the primitive streak, ushering us to a very unique time of development, which we call the gastrulation period of development. The term gastrulation is coined from the term gastrula. The gastrula refers to a trilaminar embryo. From this bilaminar embryo, we are going to get a trilaminar embryo. From a two-layered embryo, we are going to get a three-layered embryo. The three-layered embryo is what we call the gastrula. The process of forming the three-layered embryo is called gastrulation. And that process is guided by the primitive streak. And as I'm saying, the primitive streak marks the beginning of the gastrulation period of development, which will usher us into the organogenetic period of development. Remember that it forms on day 14, day 15, there we have the primitive streak. And the reason I want to remember this is because we are going to see in our next class when twinning occurs, the twins that separate around this time will be very unique and we'll see why they're unique. Great, that's why I'm pointing at that because our next class will be on twinning. So I want you to understand that there's something called the primitive streak and that it forms around the third, sorry, around the, the end of the second week, day 14, day 15, it marks the beginning of formation of body organs. Then put a comma there, we'll pick from there. Let's now talk about why it is possible to make diagnosis of early pregnancy. It is possible to make a diagnosis of early pregnancy on two accounts. We usually diagnose early pregnancy by telling a lady to provide urine sample, or sometimes you can use blood sample. What are we testing? We're just checking for beta HCG. Do we have the high levels of beta HCG? Why is that a concept? Remember, during implantation, we have secretion of beta HCG. We have secretion of HCG. Well, there are multiple types of HCG. The beta HCG is more pregnancy specific, and that's the one we use. Since each trophoblast produces HCG during implantation. And so if the levels of HCG are high, it means that could be there is implantation taking place or there is a pregnancy. And so if you have a way of detecting high levels of HCG, then we can use that as a basis of pregnancy diagnosis. HCG is present in the bloodstream, but it's also excreted in urine. And that's why we can still detect 
HCG in urine. So usually there's some scripts that uh, are let to be given. So there's a particular way the sample is put in one particular site, then you check for those strips. And that would mean a positive pregnancy test. If it's only one line, that's a negative pregnancy test. Apart from using HCG to diagnose early pregnancy, we can still use ultrasound to diagnose early pregnancy. How do we do that? When we image the maternal pelvis, we're able to see the chorionic cavity surrounded by a thick chorionic plate. And so we're able to say that that's pregnancy. That chorionic cavity would be something that looking like this. So this is the cavity. That's the chorionic plate basically that is surrounding the chorionic cavity. And that's the baby there. So this can also be done by ultrasound. And so ultrasound can also diagnose early pregnancy. Now the timing of accuracy of the ultrasound may differ depending on whether the ultrasound is being done through the abdomen of the lady or through the vagina of the lady. If the probe, the ultrasound probe is inserted through the vagina, that would be more accurate it will pick it quite early. It can see it quite early, except that maybe that's not the route we'll prefer most of the time. So sometimes we just wait for one or two weeks later, then we do the scan from the abdomen of the lady and there's no big deal. We are able to see it. The transabdominal ultrasound will see the gestational sac like one week later compared to the endovaginal ultrasound. Let's finish the lecture by talking about some abnormalities that occur during the second week of development. And uh, the abnormality I want us to discuss, we'd already discussed about it. So we'll not say much about it here because we talked about it during the lecture on implantation and the disorders of implantation. So I'm just mentioning for the sake of completion for this particular lecture, that yes, there's something called pregnancy loss, which you can call miscarriage or, or spontaneous abortion. It's defined as non-viable intrauterine pregnancy up to 20 weeks of gestation. Non-viability here simply means that the baby could be dead. We call it early pregnancy loss, however, if it's occurring in the first trimester, and that's the commonest type. Remember first trimester, if you divide the pregnancy into three periods, then the first one, corresponding with around the first 12 weeks plus six days of pregnancy. Now, the 12 plus six here of pregnancy refers to the dating based on the last normal menstrual period. And even this 20 weeks is based on the last normal menstrual period. It's not based on conceptual dating or embryonic dating, so to speak. It's based on the dating by LMP. The risk factors for early pregnancy loss would be many. We discussed them in our previous lecture. And so I want you just to understand that this can also happen during the second week of development. So there could be some non-specific bleeding as well as uterine cramping. You will hear more about ab embryonic pregnancy. And that simply means an empty gestational sac. We, during the second week of development, when we do ultrasound, we may see the gestational sac, yes, but we don't see something inside. When you don't see something inside, when you expect to see something inside, then we can make a diagnosis of ab embryonic pregnancy. Maybe too early for the second week, but uh, when the time reaches when we are supposed to see something inside the gestational sac and we are not able to see, 
then we can make that diagnosis. I don't want to talk about the timings here because this is not a radiology class. This is more of an embryology class. Later on, when we have a fetus, if the cardiac activity of the fetus is not active, there's no fetal cardiac activity, again, we can talk about what we call fetal demise. The term blighted ovum is historic, as I told you in the previous class, we no longer use it though, but you might still see some people using it. So this is how blighted ovum or abembranic pregnancy look like in the second one. There's a gestational sac without embryonic pole. Here, there's a gestational sac and we're able to see the embryonic pole. This is the yolk sac, by the way, that's the yolk sac. The visualization of the yolk sac is also very important in knowing pregnancy viability. The other thing that we talked about again, which can be seen in the second week is a molar pregnancy, which we defined as the presence of vesicular proliferation of the placental tissues, usually with or without fetal parts. We call it partial molar pregnancy. If there are fetal parts and we call it complete molar pregnancy, if there are no fetal parts. As we discussed in our previous lecture, molar pregnancy occur if you have extra set of paternal genome. And this can come as a result of many mechanisms. For example, if the oocyte was fertilized by more than one sperm, we call that polyspermy. You're going to have conceptors with a triploid karyotype. But these conceptors with triploid karyotype has two sets of paternal genome and one set of maternal genome. And so you may have different karyotypes to that nature. This will give you molar pregnancy. Another mechanism is, let's say, the, the oocyte is fertilized by only a single sperm, but that single sperm replicates its genome before fusion. It means, again, that the conceptors will have a triploid karyotype with those two types of karyotype. Again, it means that you have extra paternal genome. So this will also give you molar pregnancy. The first two, this and the previous one, will give you partial molar pregnancy because the maternal genome is present. But the third one is unique where an oocyte can be fertilized by one or two sperms. If it is fertilized by, okay, the oocyte that's being fertilized here is genetically empty which means doesn't have the genome, the maternal genome. If this genetically empty oocyte is fertilized by a single sperm, that single sperm usually will replicate its genome. So you realize that in this one, actually the total number of chromosomes is 46. So it might deceive you to be normal. However, the abnormality here is that all of them are paternal in origin. There's no maternal genome. This one will give you complete molar pregnancy. So those are the mechanisms of molar pregnancy. We can start seeing them during the second week of development, but we'll see them more in the earlier, in the later, okay, let me say in later stages of the early pregnancy periods. So remember, it's characterized by vesicular proliferation of placental tissues. Good, so that is it. We will stop there. That is uh, the events that take place during the second week of development. Our next class will be on multiple gestation.